Hello, good afternoon, Fulcheroy, everybody. You're very welcome to our session this afternoon entitled, or rather titled, Multi-Unit Development Signposts for Practitioners and Stakeholders. David Rouse is my name. I am an uh, advisor with uh, the uh, Housing Agency on Multi-Unit Developments and Owners Management Companies. We're joined this afternoon by my two colleagues, Katrina Lawler and Mary Coffey. And Katrina and Mary are going to help on the technical and support side. And we're joined by our uh, panelists and presenters, uh, Suzanne Bainton, Conal Tuhi, and Patricia um, Murphy, who I'll introduce in more detail shortly. Um, while we are um, waiting for people to uh, log in, we will um, show you our timetable for this afternoon. Uh, we will have a short introduction session from myself on news in the apartment and multi-unit development sector. We move on then to our presentations from our, uh, from our presenters. We'll have a panel session of Q&A and we'll uh, endeavour to wrap up by about uh, one o'clock. We do have a very packed session for you uh, this afternoon. We're going to cover a lot in a very short space of uh, time. And uh, we uh, would like to express our uh, sincere thanks to the Law Society and to Catherine O'Flaherty and to our panelists for, for their collaboration and engagement um, this, after, uh, this afternoon. So while we're waiting on a lot of people to uh, join us, we're going to run a, a quick poll. And um, these polls are all uh, anonymous. And we will um, launch the poll now. And really, we just want to find out uh, who's actually joining us today. Because while we know we have a large contingent from the Law Society, we have other interested parties uh, in, the, uh, in the sector. So uh, as I say, this poll is entirely Anonymous, feel free to uh, please uh, participate and let us know uh, who you are and who is uh, who is joining us. And uh, while that poll uh, is running, I will um, briefly uh, move on to uh, some uh, housekeeping for uh, for our session uh, this afternoon. And um, as you know, this is effectively like live television, so you can uh, see and hear us, but we can't see and hear you. There is the question and answer function, and we'd ask you to put your questions into that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical problems or if there seems to be a difficulty with sound or vision from our side, please let us know through the chat function. Um, don't use the Q&A for that. And equally, please don't use the Q&A. Please don't use the chat for your, for your questions. We'll try and delineate it that way. Uh, as you know from your registration details, uh, that this session is being um, recorded for uh, future, uh, future use and uh, training. Um, so uh, while our poll is finishing up, um, I will uh, let you know uh, how that is uh, how that is uh, going. And uh, we have uh, so we have 30% uh, of our attendees today are solicitors, 18% are OMC uh, directors. We have about 15% uh, management agents and some uh, accountants and other participants. So I'm going to end that poll now, really, just to show you uh, the interactivity of our session and to, uh, to, get a, to get a sense of, of who's with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, as I say, for participating in that uh, particular poll. Uh, so moving back to um, our, uh, our housekeeping and our um, background for, uh, for today, as I say, we're very grateful for our uh, presenters. Uh, Suzanne Bainton is our first presenter this afternoon. Suzanne is a member of the uh, Conveyance and Committee of the Law Society. Suzanne is a partner in WT Liston & Co. Uh, in, uh, in Dublin and Suzanne has lectured widely on the MUDs and uh, OMC sector for the Law Society. Cole Tuhi is Managing Partner of Kane Tuhi uh, Solicitors in uh, Dublin and Cole is an expert in the area of uh, MUDs Law, Landlord and Tenant uh, Litigation and uh, many of you will be familiar with Conal's recent uh, briefing note on OMCs and service charges. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from Conal this afternoon. Also with us as a panelist, we're delighted to have uh, its a senior executive solicitor with Cork County Council, Patricia uh, Murphy. Uh, Patricia has worked in uh, private practice and now works, as I say, with Cork County Council. And she's a volunteer director of uh, an OMC uh, in Cork City. Uh, Patricia has lectured uh, and delivered presentations on OMCs to um, various uh, solicitors bar associations and as a co-author of an article on the MUD sector in the Law Society Gazette a number of months ago. We should say that um, obviously we're in a very difficult period nationally and to bear in mind the implications more widely of uh, COVID-19 and the government's advice for 
uh, for the sector, um, for, for nationally and for the sector, and to, I suppose, couch any of the comments today in the context of, uh, of the current uh, COVID situation. We would also equally say that um, the presentations today are meant to be general in nature. There will be particular circumstances and particular cases that you will have with their own facts and circumstances, and you should always uh, seek the advice of your, your legal expert, your, your solicitor uh, or management agent as appropriate, uh, depending on the particular issues. A word about ourselves. The Housing Agency, we are an organisation under the aegis of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government. We're on um, Upper Mount Street and we work with departments, with um, local uh, authorities, with AHBs and other stakeholders in the sector. And we're involved now in the multi-unit development sector because of our mission and our ethos to uh, promote the building of sustainable communities. And we understand the, uh, the issues and the sustainability matters uh, in relation to uh, owners management uh, companies. Um, so quick uh, background on the sector, some numbers. About 170,000 apartments in multi-unit developments in the country uh, as of uh, census uh, 2016. Um, we have uh, a large increase in the number of apartments in national housing stock, both through the uh, planning process. You can see the orange line is the uh, number of apartments running through uh, the planning process and in Q1 of 2020, apartment completions far outstripped uh, other housing typologies in the number of units uh, being uh, being developed. Uh, owners management companies, the run rate in terms of incorporation at the moment um, through the CRO is about three new owners management companies every week in the country um, according to CRO records, so an expanding sector as we know. During the COVID crisis and in normal times, anyone involved in the sector is involved in a, in a collective and collaborative uh, endeavour to uh, make owners, management companies and MUD successful. And the slide there really is just to highlight all the different players and participants um, in the sector. As I mentioned earlier, you can send us an email, MUD at housingagency.ie for a copy of these slides. A quick word in more detail on the COVID situation. We're obviously uh, in, a, in a particular phase, phase one of that uh, roadmap uh, plan that the government has to bring us out of the, uh, the current difficulties. We prepared at the start of the uh, pandemic crisis uh, some fact sheets and information for owners management companies available on our website. You'd be familiar with the um, definitions of essential services available again from the gov.ie uh, website and cleaning and waste and repairs and maintenance for, uh, for apartments and residential buildings are considered to be essential services. But again, you should check that out for yourselves and, and take, take advice on that. MyWaste.ie have developed some uh, information and resources in relation to managing waste during the COVID crisis. So you can check that out on their website. The statutory instruments there for, for the uh, regulations are uh, SI 121 of 2020 and the more recent one bringing the measures up to uh, the 8th of June is statutory instrument 174 2020 and as you know uh, we will have a roadmap update uh, expected on Friday ahead of phase two uh, next uh, Monday. Some other quick updates you may wish to know about the licensing period for property services providers has been extended to the 31st of August and you can check out the website of the Property Services Regulator for more on that. IPAV, the SCSI and the Property Services Regulator have collaborated on a joint sector protocol for property service providers in the opening up of the sector, so you may be interested in that. The company's office have extended the annual return filing arrangements. It was to uh, cease in uh, June and now it's been extended to the 31st of October, so owners management companies ideally, of course, should file their returns in, in uh, compliance with the normal, normal uh, annual return date, but there is that grace period available. For more information on the COVID situation, you can check out webinars that we delivered uh, earlier in the, uh, in the pandemic situation, far, as far back as 31st of March, which feels like uh, several decades ago for a lot of us at this stage. Upcoming webinars for the, from the Housing Agency for the sector on the 16th of June, which is Bloom's Day, will be in our Boaters and Blazers with uh, Engineers Ireland talking about apartments and multi-unit developments and sustainability of buildings around building life cycle reports and costs. And then at the end of the month, the uh, Corporate Governance Institute, the Institute of Corporate Secretaries, um, will be uh, collaborating with us on a session on corporate governance. So looking at company law for owners, management companies and the company secretarial aspects. So keep an eye on our website uh, for registration details and on our social media. Um, on Twitter, etc., and you'll get registration details there. We also have resources and information on our website for owners, management companies, and you're feel free to access that. A word of 
um, interest on our report last year on the sector, also available on, uh, on our website, information and background on best practice in other countries and ideas for progress in the sector. Some writing that you may want to check out on OMCs and MUDs if you want to dig some more into the detail. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, background um, undertaking some writing on, uh, on the sector that you may wish to touch on and also to highlight a recent article in the Business Post by Finbar McDonnell of the SCSI on OMC Finance is well worth, uh, well worth a read for Business Post uh, subscribers. A quick reminder of the apartment planning guidelines that all new apartment developments must consider building life cycle reports, must consider the establishment of the OMC and compliance with the MUD Act in terms of long-term running costs and maintenance, so worth bearing that in mind. A quick word on some publications that you might want to look at, the ODC Handbook from 2012, which as uh, I often uh, add the uh, health warning is out of date for company law references because it hasn't been updated for Companies Act 2014, but perhaps watch this space. And equally, the uh, present the uh, publication from Claris Press by Ashling Keenan, management agent in the West of Ireland, owners management company law and best practice. For some wider reading on policy side, before we get on to the, um, the, the legal technical with Suzanne and Connell, the policies and practices of the politics and practices of apartment living by Hazel Eastall, uh, in Australia as well worth the read. And I suppose for wider context and thoughts, to try and put the city by Ed uh, Glazer, who is a, a Harvard economics professor as well worth considering in the context of the pandemic and the future of multi-unit developments and high density living. And one, one graphic that I thought might be interesting for people was to pull out that uh, particular um, graphic, uh, which reflects on uh, pandemics and disease in the city of New York from about 1800 up to the middle of um, the 1900s. So you can see the various, um, uh, the various disease outbreaks, mainly cholera uh, in New York over all those years. But at the very bottom of the graph, you can see the population of New York steadily rose and in fact it boomed across all those periods. So I suppose, what does that say to us? It says that uh, high density accommodation uh, has a future despite public health concerns because ultimately the public health system addresses the matters uh, and, and deals with the, uh, with the health issues and things get back to a, a level playing field, if you like, or an equilibrium over, uh, over time. So I thought it was worth um, pulling that up and reflecting on it. As I say, contact us, Mud at Housing Agency, for the slides. Moving on to the meat of, of today's session. First up is Suzanne, Suzanne Bainton, and Suzanne's going to talk to us about frequently invoked sections of the Mud Act reflections on requisitions on title and touch on the OMC constitution. And then Conal will uh, dig into recent case law in the sector, talk about the recovery, uh, the, the challenges of uh, service charge debt recovery, and we will look then at the future direction of uh, MUD uh, law. And uh, so we're looking forward to hearing, uh, to, uh, Connell, uh, hearing from Conal on those. So I'm going to uh, ask Suzanne perhaps to please unmute herself, and uh, I'm going to put her uh, slides up and uh, hopefully we can all see that okay and uh, i would say uh, over to you suzanne thank you very much thanks very much david um i'll i'll get going quickly because i know we're under time pressure in terms of the presentations are not pressure but uh, they're not uh just going to talk for about 15 minutes in terms of the first section, the, uh, the I'll refer to it throughout as the MUD Act, uh, the, the frequently invoked sections. Uh, this would be the sections that in my practice I would come across more, most frequently in terms of advising management companies on. Um, the first three there, sections three, four and five, deal with the transfer of common areas and the MUD Act, uh, certainly from my uh, perspective, is actually each section was aimed at solving an issue or a problem uh, with uh, multi-unit developments. And a big one was the, uh, the, the delay in transfer of common areas. So um, for schemes, the, the solution in Section 3 uh, for schemes where no unit had been sold prior to the Act coming in was to require the transfer of the common areas before a developer could sell. Um, and uh, it's the uh, legal interest that has to be transferred so that the title in the property comes across to the management company, but the developer is still the beneficial owner, still own, has full use of the common areas, uh, still entitled to all the proceeds of sale. Um, there's also a requirement uh, for developments uh, post April 11 to have, or sorry, where nothing was sold, that's, a, that's an important uh, point uh, prior to that date, 
uh, to have a contract. Uh, the developer has to enter into a contract with the management company for the completion of the common areas. That was a big gap for multi-unit developments. Uh, management companies had no contractual remedy uh, in relation to defects in common areas. The management company has to have separate legal representation in relation to both those documents and the developer has to cover the reasonable legal fees involved. Um, that, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't, the requirement to have separate legal representation and the requirement for the developer to pay the fees doesn't arise in the, the section 4 and section 5 cases that I'll talk about now. Um, the section four and section five cases, they were aimed at a, um, a sweep, they were sweeping up provisions. They were aimed at developments where you had units sold. Uh, section four, where you had less than 80% sold as of 1st April 11, and section five, where you had more than 80% sold. And the requirement there is to, was to transfer the common areas by the 1st of October 2011. Uh, that's a long time ago now, uh, nearly 29 years ago. Uh, and uh, in a lot of developments, the common areas Area still hasn't been transferred uh, in accordance with those sections but there is a remedy uh, there's no penalty uh, for the developer for not having transferred by that date but there is a remedy under the act in that the management company can apply to court for an order to have them transferred section six is a section uh, i'd often refer to where it, 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 it comes up in a circumstance where the control of the management company has gone over to the owners um, and the developer still has unsold units and the developer uh, is requesting or asking the management company to sign the unit deeds uh, for the sale and the management company might say well we'll do that but you know we want you to do this that or the other before uh, we'll sign and section six uh, obliges the management company to join in the deed uh, there's no time limit in the section uh, but it is something to be borne in mind if a request is made Section seven, uh, this was brought in because of um sometimes management companies didn't want to take the transfer of the common areas because there were outstanding issues. Um, and uh the um section seven was brought in to reassure management companies that the transfer of the common areas in itself doesn't relieve the developer from an obligation to complete the development in accordance with planning and building regulations and indeed one of the orders a management company can seek in a mud act application is an order to enforce compliance with those laws which could be a very useful uh, remedy Section 8.3, this is a, a very practical section because again, one of the issues management companies had uh, was getting owner's details, uh, contact details for people who they were trying to maybe chase service charges from, uh, or contact details for access, or in the case of a, of a sale, you know, uh, sometimes it could be a long time before the management company got the information about the new owner. So there's now a statutory obligation to provide that information, uh, not only about the owner, but about any tenants and, and, and habitual occupiers. Um, there's no GDPR issue, uh, just to mention that, because it's in, there's a legal obligation under the MUD Act to provide this information, so it's not in breach of GDPR uh, to, to furnish it. Section 13, um, this can be a useful provision. It only applies uh, where the um, the management company wants to carry out works in an area of the development not within its ownership or control. So if the common areas haven't been transferred and the management company wants to do works uh, that maybe should have been done by the developer or if they need to go into an apartment and do works um, and those works have to be necessary to ensure safe and effective occupation or peaceful enjoyment. Uh, if it's not an emergency the responsible person has to be uh, given an opportunity to do the work works in advance but the important point is here is that if the management company goes in and does those works it can it is a statutory right then to recover the costs from the responsible person um, and that can be uh, very useful in in that particular circumstance where works need to be done if I could just go to the next slide uh, David Jet sections 18 and 19 um, are about uh, service charges um, uh, to use the collective term, the, the Act divides up your regular and annual service charge on recurring things like insurance, gardening, uh, maintenance, uh, you know, recurring maintenance, and then your sinking fund contributions, which are uh, non-recurring items. 
And in Section 18, uh, there's an obligation to set up a scheme in relation to service charges. That's certainly, in my experience, without exception, in the title deeds. Um, the annual service charge has to be considered at a general meeting before being levied on the owners. Um, it sets out the categories of expenditure, there's a list in the section, has to be approved of by at least 25% of the members present in voting, so very low threshold. Uh, if it isn't approved, it, uh, last year's uh, budget continues to apply. Uh, service charge levies, now this is service charges under of the uh, developer unless a number of uh, conditions are met. Uh, one, 75% of the members have to approve, not just those that are present at a meeting, all of the members. 65% uh, of the units have to be sold to unconnected parties and three years have to have passed since the transfer of the common areas. So it would be difficult, if not impossible, to use your regular service charge on uh, developer items. There's a statutory obligation to pay the service charge, which is important uh, if uh, typically with a unit that has been retained by a developer, there may not be a lease uh, or there might be a, a defect in the lease uh, in relation to the service charge, or you may not have the counterpart lease. So it can be very useful to have this, to rely on the statutory obligation. And if you're doing debt collection for management companies, uh, I think it's useful to rely on both the contractual obligation and the statutory obligation to pay and service charges have to be uh, transparent and equitably apportioned and any excess can be used for the sinking fund. Then to talk about the sinking fund, section 19, this was brought in because a lot of management companies either didn't have a sinking fund or had a very underfunded sinking fund. Uh, so there's an obligation to have a sinking fund. It can only be used for four things. Um, the refurbishment, improvement, maintenance of a non-recurring nature or advice from a suitably qualified, they have to be suitably qualified or else they, they can't be paid, um, on those three issues. Uh, if it's maintenance of a non-recurring nature, it has to be certified by the directors and approved of by a meeting of the members of the ONC. On a practical basis, if you had non-recurring maintenance uh, that was, um, and it was it came up, you know, the lift broke or something, and you had to get uh, use the sinking fund uh, to re replace it or, or repair it. Uh, it is somewhat uh, cumbersome that you have to have a meeting uh, to approve it um, unless you knew the lift was going to break, but uh, that's what the Act uh, requires. Um, and each owner has to pay, so again, that covers off your, your developer uh, units. Uh, you don't have to have a lease in place. There's a statutory obligation to pay, and the amount is 200 euro, or the amount is maybe agreed by a meeting of the members. So it could be two euro, it could be 2,000 euro, um, and the sinking fund is to be held in a separate account to the regular service charge. Section 23, House Rules. Um, I've probably given advice on this section a lot more than I thought, you know, maybe when the act came in that would arise, but it came, it, the, the aim of the section was to address uh, a perception that directors of management companies would make house rules without, re without reference to the members at all, and, and house rules that suited them and perhaps not the general membership. So um, an OMC can make house rules. They have to be consistent with the covenants and conditions in the deeds. Uh, they can't be uh, at odds with them. They have to have the objective of advancing the quiet and peaceful enjoyment of the property, a very legal term, but obviously they're, they're to be there for to, to improve people's lives. Um, and uh, the objective of the fair and equitable balancing of the rights and obligations of the occupier. So, for example, in relation to pets, an owner might say, well, I've an, I've an entitlement to have a pet, uh, but yet there is an obligation to uh, uh, other people to allow them live peacefully um, and again you have to consider whatever house rules you make about pets are they consistent with what's in the title deeds have to be approved of in a meeting of the members you have to have 21 days even though it's not a special resolution and you have to circulate the house rules with the notice of the meeting landlords have to include in their letting agreements the not only the house rules but the covenants in the title documents and put in a summary and of practical importance, the OMC can recover the reasonable costs of remedying a material breach. Now, it does have to be a material breach, uh, but it can recover those costs from the person who's committed the breach. It may not be the unit owner, it might be a tenant, so easier said than done in, in many circumstances. Dispute resolution, um, there are certain categories of people and you have to be in within that category. Uh, and I know Conal is going to mention a case on that issue. You can apply to court for a range of remedies uh, under the Act. 
uh, to enforce an obligation under the Act or a right uh, under the Act. Um, you have to, when you apply to court, say whether you've try, tr attempted mediation, and there are wide ranging orders, including changing the legal documentation, amending the lease covenants, uh, directing a minority to comply with the decisions made by the majority. So, um, and, he, and the list that's in the Act isn't all of the orders a uh, court can make, it's just a, a, a sample of the orders. Uh, so, very wide uh, remedies. I think if I can go to the next slide, I'm just going to move on to the next topic, which is Requisition 36. For those of you who are, who are not solicitors, requisitions are a list of questions um, that are sent out with the contract for the sale of a property in Ireland. And a lot of them deal with legislation that affects property. And obviously the MUD Act is one of those pieces of legislation. So Requisition 36 lists a, lot, uh, a series of questions to do with, with the MUD Act and uh, the property that's for sale. They are currently under review uh, by the Law Society um, there's consideration of issues whether we should be asking if there's been a fire safety audit, whether we should ask for the minutes of the last AGM um, and we're also considering an issue um, about whether what solicitors should do when they're asked for an undertaking to pay service charges before the information will be given to them uh, to complete the replies uh, typically by a firm of managing agents um, and there are whilst I can certainly understand the um, uh, the, 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 the reason a managing agent would request the undertaking um, there are uh, solicitors are obliged to keep a register of all of their undertakings. They can't give an undertaking without client's instructions. Uh, they can't give an undertaking that they're not in a position to comply with that's outside of their control. So it's not always as simple as just giving an undertaking. Um, solicitors will be looking in the replies to see whether the common areas have been transferred. There are practice notes, the transfer in itself isn't a, a defect in the title, but if the developer is being dissolved, if the development is very many years old without any movement on the transfer, that can be a concern. Um, and um, a number of some of the replies, li li a limited number though, do require require to be confirmed by the vendor. Um, and so the uh, rec the requisitions should be the answer should be signed by the solicitor acting for the vendor, relying of course on the information uh, provided by the OMC. And just a final point to note: one of the issues uh, that that can arise out of the replies is the uh, answers to the questions about whether there's a proposal to incur expenditure that can affect the level of the service charge payable or any claim against the management company funds and certainly if there's a perhaps a fire safety audit uh, pending or, or uh, the, the cost of repair work unknown that can cause uh, you know that can lead to further queries and uh, de sometimes delays in relation to the conveyancing process. The last issue is the OMC constitution. There is a there is a template constitution for owner management companies. If a, if as a solicitor you're setting one up or you're looking to amend um, the constitution, owner they it takes into account the Companies Act 2014 and the MUD Act, so uh, brings you totally up to date. Allows a management company to disclose debtor details and breaches of house rules without being a breach of GDPR. Uh, allows for electronic service of documents. And just um, I, I'm not sure about time, but it just I finish up if if you're amending or looking at amending an existing constitution the issues in my experience that you would uh, look at would be the quorum uh, whether people have to be there in present person or by proxy very topical now whether directors have to be unit owners uh, they typically don't in a, in a constitution circumstances in which a director can be removed and electronic voting a very again very topical not currently uh, in in many I actually haven't seen it in the constitution but it's something that might be considered going forward so thank you. Wow, that was a whistle-stop tour of the Mud Act and of the OMC um, Constitution. So thank you very much, Suzanne, for that. Um, I know that uh, people will be uh, delighted to get uh, such a fantastic, insightful uh, overview of, of the Act and of requisitions on title issues and, uh, and the Constitution. We could obviously devote uh, an hour to each topic individually, I think, and maybe that's something for the, for the future. But uh, thank you very much indeed for, for that, uh, Suzanne. We'll move on now to, uh, to Conan's presentation. So I'd ask Conan to unmute his mic there and uh, I'll bring up his uh, slides and hopefully we can um, see them here on screen and uh, launch them. And uh, over to you, uh, Conan, thank you very much. 
Uh, good afternoon. Um, the topic for my discussions are set out, uh, in particular, the recent case law. Uh, one of the problems we've encountered to date is an absence of reported decisions because most of the litigation in relation to the MUDS Act, as you know, comes before the circuit court whose judgments are not recorded and therefore not available in the same way as high court judgments are. And so the recent um, high court judgments that we've received um, and have been published are to be welcomed because they do give a lot of clarity uh, to the wider community in relation to how the MUDS Act is judicially interpreted. I'm going to go very quickly through the case law and I'm going to try and pick out the main themes from each of the cases. The slides I've prepared go into a, a relative amount of detail just to give participants some idea of the issues and how they were teased out in each of the cases. Uh, we don't have the time to go through the issues in detail, hence I will try and stick to the themes. Uh, on slide number three, um, which is the commences the case of Lee Towers Management Company, etc. This was um, an application by the management company under Section 24 to avail of certain orders to compel the developer to do certain things. And the circuit court before whom the application came duly made those orders and there is set out at number, uh, slide number three. And um, the issue, of course, was that the developer was in liquidation. And the issue which this case therefore considered was the extent to which the orders made under the MUDS Act trumped, for want of a better word, the statutory scheme which applies to all companies in liquidation and which deals with the priority of claims uh, to creditors. So as you may be aware, where a company is in liquidation, a statutory scheme is put in place which effectively creates a trust in respect of that company's assets and then those assets are paid out or distributed by the liquidator in accordance with a pre-existing and well understood priority. So you'll be aware there are certain preferential or super preferential creditors, preferential creditors, secured creditors and on all the way down to unsecured creditors. And in this Lee Towers case, the net issue was, do the orders made by the circuit court, whereby the developer had to transfer the common areas and had to undertake repairs, do those constitute a priority claim over other creditors in the liquidation? And moving to uh, slide four, the determination firmly made was that the orders made do not give the OMC preferential status. So even it also went on to find that um, even though the development was completed many years before the MUDS Act, it was completed in fact in 2001, and even though the developer went into liquidation prior to the MUDS Act in 2010, I believe, the MUDS Act still had retrospective effect insofar as the enforcement of existing obligations and rights were concerned. And that was really focused on the management agreement. Notwithstanding the absence of priority, the court did say that the obligation to transfer the common areas was specifically enforceable. And so the liquidator would therefore have to comply with that. Um, in my experience of developers in liquidation, liquidators don't need to be forced to transfer the common areas. They actually want to transfer the common areas because they can't complete their liquidation until that's done. And um, moving on to the next, uh, sorry, the final comment as per page five of the slides. The decision is important because it highlights the statutory entitlements that are there for the OMC. And it makes it clear that if you are able to satisfy the necessary proofs, i.e. a developer's failure to comply with planning or building control, then you can get an order against the developer. The issue, of course, is enforceability, in particular in circumstances where the developer is in liquidation. 
Um, having said that, as I mentioned earlier, the transfer of the common areas can be enforced. The next case is uh, Paddy Burke Builders. This is a decision of Mr. Justice Dennis MacDonald um, in 2020. It has a complicated or at least complex background. Um, the case began through a statutory receiver, which is appointed by NAMA. And what it sought to do was to compel the OMC to accept a transfer of the common areas. And Suzanne mentioned earlier the relevant section under the MUDS Act, which creates that statutory obligation for an OMC to uh, take a transfer of the common areas. Shortly after the statutory receiver was appointed, the company goes into liquidation. The OMC defended the statutory receiver's case on the basis that the developer had failed to comply, or sorry, to complete the common areas and provide and wanted it to provide the necessary finance to do so. Their matters rested, and in fact, the the, the proceedings remained in abeyance for about four years. In late 2019, a new receiver who had been appointed four years earlier in place of the statutory receiver. So what happened was NAMA sold to Promontoria and Promontoria then appointed their own receiver and NAMA's receiver stood down. Promontoria's receiver sounded, found a buyer for the development or at least the remaining parts of it. The OMC then sought to uh, get an injunction against that receiver from completing the sale until certain matters were attended to, in particular the completion of the common areas, etc. This then came up to the High Court, and as per slide seven uh, under the issues, um, the first issue the court had to consider was what's the threshold of proof? Was it a strong case that had to be made out or a, 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 the lesser threshold? And it found it had to make a strong case. Moving on on the slides, um, the, there was four main areas the court considered. The management company agreements, the reliefs under the MUDS Act, whether the OMC could, uh, could withhold its consent to the transfer of obligations under the management agreement, and whether there had been a, an adoption of the management agreements. I'm going to move very swiftly on um, in terms of the slides just because of time constraints. Suffice it to say, the main themes of this decision are that the court found on its particular facts that the OMC did not reach the necessary threshold to satisfy the court that it had a strong case on any of those four grounds. And it concluded in relation to the management agreement that the charges on foot of which the receiver were appointed predated the management agreements. And effectively, they took um, in priority to the management agreements, which meant effectively that Promontoria was not bound by those management agreements and was free therefore to deal with the property. In relation to the reliefs under the MUDS Act, the receivers were deemed by the court not to be bound by the pre-existing contracts, i.e. the management agreement. And in so doing, um, it found, relying on the earlier decision of Lee's Tower, that the receiver effectively had priority because of its prior charge insofar as the management agreements were concerned. So it took in priority to the obligations created by the management agreements. In relation to the assignment of the burdens under the management agreement, the um, management company sought to argue that the obligations and burdens of the management agreement, which the receiver wanted to transfer to the, uh, uh, to the purchaser, could not be transferred without its consent. But the court found that in fact, the management company still had a cause of action against the developer under the management agreements. 
of course, the reality is that that would be a cause of action against a developer in liquidation which had no assets and was effectively not worth anything. Moving on to slide 12. Um, the OMC in this case, it seemed to me, launched their action shortly after the judgment in the Graham decision. And in the Graham decision, the court concluded that the receivers had adopted the management agreements and were therefore bound by it. And they found this on a number of grounds, namely that the receivers were, first of all, seeking to enforce the management agreement. They were relying on it. They'd also sold a number of units in the development and in so doing had relied on the management company agreement and also had taken steps themselves to repair part of the common areas. And on that basis in Graham, the court found that the receiver had adopted the management agreement. However, in the, uh, in the existing case, uh, Mr. Justice MacDonald found that none of those particular facts applied here, such that the receivers did not adopt the management agreement. They did not sell any units, they weren't seeking to rely on it. And that being so, it concluded that the receivers were not liable on the management agreement. And therefore, the priority arose insofar as their charge was concerned. It also dealt with the inclusion of the management agreements in, title, in the title. And the OMC had tried to argue, well, hold on, the receiver is selling the property and in so doing, in the title, they're relying on the management agreements. But the court distinguished that from Grehan and said, look, simply because they are recited in the title that the receiver is passing is not of itself sufficient to make the receiver liable on the management agreements. Um, the mere existence of the agreements and their reference to them doesn't mean that the receiver has adopted them. And on that basis found that the receiver was not bound by those management agreements. It, interestingly, in, in slide 13 on the balance of convenience, there was a passing observation by the court in relation to uh, the undertaking as to damages, which is an undertaking every party must give where they seek an injunction. And interestingly, the court said there was no information before it to satisfy itself as to whether a management company could levy members to meet a claim on such an undertaking. Um, slide 14, uh, there was no reference in the judgment to section 149 of the NAMA Act 2009. And I've put it in there because it's an interesting um, statutory provision and I'm not aware that it has been canvassed in any high court case, but it seems to me on the face of it, it would appear to amend the general principle that a receiver is not bound by the charger's contracts. Um, in that even if they do adopt the, char the, the developer's contract or the management agreement, then the liability still rests with the developer. Um, it was certainly used against me in litigation I was involved in. It never came before the court as the, that litigation settled. Uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, interesting little case, an application by a tenant for leave to bring proceedings because, uh, as you know, under the class of persons, listed in the MUDS Act, um, the, Mr. Kennedy had to the, satisfy the court that he was a person who the court saw fit and the court concluded that he was and that there was a relatively low threshold for somebody to satisfy the court that they were a, a proper person to bring proceedings. Debt recovery challenges, um, you're all I'm sure well aware of, of these practical issues, delay given the court lists, um, differences between party and party costs and solicitor and client costs and I think that's one of the questions uh, that we might get to later. Inadequate documentation and um, if you come to court and you're making a claim in particular on the statutory side you need to be able to, adv to advance your proofs and you advance your proofs by proving the documents which means you have to have the documents in court and a director in court in the witness box to prove the documents. If you don't do that your claim will not succeed. It touches on witnesses as well. And then the personal insolvency arrangements, just a practical note there. If an agent receives a notice under um, the Personal Insolvency Act of a personal insolvency practitioner's intention to include the service charge debt in the insolvency arrangement, unless you reply in writing, 
within 21 days, specifically saying you do not consent, then you're deemed to consent. So it's an important one to, for agents in particular to watch out for. Future directions, um, whether there is a argument to resolve service charges through a different forum um, and to speed it up, not unlike, for example, the Residential Tenancies Board. Uh, second point there on, on uh, uh, slide 17, and this comes out of the a decision of Mr. Justice MacDonald, whether there's something to be said for imposing a limitation on receivers um, where they sell the common areas and where there are defects and to effectively put in place a statutory provision that in such cases some priority is given to the OMC before the receiver can dispose of the property. Uh, and finally, uh, and touching on the, the flowing from the second point, whether there's something to be said for amending the statutory scheme of priorities and liquidations, again, to give some priority to an OMC. Um, thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Connell. Fantastic uh, insights and uh, depth of uh, analysis of a number of the recent uh, cases in the, uh, in the sector. And I can see we have lots of questions, but again, I'm conscious of time and that it is a uh, quarter to one. I want to try and respect everyone's time, our presenters, our participants. And we're just going to quickly, um, we're going to quickly launch another poll, I suppose, coming out of uh, the various presentations and to get some feedback from yourselves. As I say, this is an interactive session. So in your opinion, which of the following would most benefit the apartments multi-unit development sector? Um, would it be mandatory training for OMC directors, more effective enforcement of service charge debt, Regulation of OMCs, for example, in the way that the PSRA regulates agents, or do some of you feel that there are no changes required, or is there something else where you don't know? So maybe give us your views. This poll is anonymous, as I mentioned earlier on, so it's really just to get your own uh, your own feedback and your own sense of of the uh, of the sector, having listened to our two um, expert um, speakers. And while that poll is uh, is just running through, about half of you have voted now, so thank you very much for that, uh, Patricia. I might ask you to. Uh, unmute and indeed all of our, our panelists we might all unmute um, because we'll go to the Q&A um, now and um, I suppose Patricia I might just ask you for your initial sort of uh, thoughts on the, our presenters uh, presentations and some of the main uh, themes that you've maybe come across from your public sector point of view. Um, hi David I'd like to thank um, both our presenters um, those um, presentations were highly informative. Um, from my own point of view within Cork County Council um, I have found that in the last year or two, Cork County Council have been um, acquiring increasing numbers of um, apartments um, with a view to offsetting the housing crisis in Cork. Um, I have found for the most part that the acquisitions have been relatively straightforward. We did have one case where an acquisition was delayed um, on the grounds that the owner's management company and the uh, developer were in litigation with regards to um, the allocation of voting rights, which was very interesting. This was a mixed use development where there was a commercial and residential properties. And then we've also um, encountered scenarios where Cork County Council are purchasing all of, the, all of the apartments in a development and the developer has tried to shirk his obligations under section three. Um, he basically wants Cork County Council to be responsible for the establishment of the um, of the OMC. So these are just, these are obviously, the, and there's this pushback then from Cork County Council in that regard, because there's so, there's so many onerous obligations um, there under the CRO, et cetera. So that's the kind of thing that I'm encountering. And then also okay. from the point of view of, um, of conveying things, just making sure that you have all title matters, all the, the relevant title documents, ensuring that you have everything that you need for the OMC before you close. That's the kind of thing that I deal with. That's my bread and butter on a day to day basis. Very good. Thank you for that contribution. We might um, just reflect on the uh, poll um, results, which I flashed up uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, the vast majority, or sorry, um, the majority, 51%, felt that a more effective enforcement of service charge deaths would be the best um, change for uh, for the uh, for the sector. So thank you for sharing your your views on that. 
Now to our uh, Q&A um, session. We have uh, 35 questions that have come in on, uh, on the Q&A function, but I am going to apply, if my amateur um, legal knowledge is right, I'm going to apply the principle of equity that the first in time prevails. Um, so we had some uh, questions that came in uh, earlier on. Um, and so thank you very much for the people who emailed us in. And the first question is, uh, and I might put this to Connell, please. What is the court's view of the relatively high rates of interest charged in leases on unpaid service charge debt? In my view, they're unenforceable. They're deemed penal rates of interest and a court will not enforce a penal rate of interest. There's high court case law to that effect by Ms. Justice Finley Gagan, I think in the case concerning a bank which had sought to apply a penal rate of interest and it was found to be unenforceable because it did not reflect the actual cost to the party seeking the charge. It must relate to some loss and you cannot therefore impose an arbitrary rate of interest that some leases do. I see them as high as 20%. Simply put, they're unenforceable. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Connell, the next question um, that came in uh, was, um, the MUD Act sets out very clearly, and Patricia, I might like look to you on this, the MUD Act sets out very clearly what the annual report should contain. I was wondering if you could point me in the direction of where I could get a pro forma or sample report. Um, yes, I believe, um, I, I believe I have a copy of something like that. I, I can arrange to forward that to you um, after the, yeah, after the session and then perhaps yeah. you can forward it on to others. Yeah, absolutely. I think probably management agents um, in the States should be well, should be well equipped to, to equipped, go back. Equipped, I agree. Like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, next uh, question, which I might um, put to, um, uh, well, I think we covered it. What are the key evidentiary documents sought by the courts in a service charges debt enforcement case? Do you want any, to add anything, Connell, on what you said earlier? Uh, no, uh, it, it's at slide 16. It summarizes the types of documents. Great, thank you for that. Um, a strange one that came in was one of our shareholders has an agreement in place to be exempt from the property management fee. Is this allowed? So maybe what I asked Suzanne to comment on that. It's, it's, something, it's kind of an odd one. Sounds like there might be a shareholder's agreement in the background or something. Yeah, I haven't come across it myself in practice. Um, I mean, there's a statutory obligation to pay service charges, so you can't contract out of that. Uh, whatever about contracting out of the obligation to pay the service charge in the lease. Uh, but I think you'd require more detail to, you know, uh, advise. You need to know the background. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're anxious to stress that what we're giving here is, is general commentary and that anyone with specific queries should, should contact their uh, contact your solicitor and they'll be able to look at all the documents and all the background facts and circumstances of the uh, of the particular uh, of the particular case. Um, so our next uh, question that came in um, is um, requisition on Title 36 includes the following. Furnish written confirmation from the OMC that the service charge has been paid up to date. Does this include that number one, these charges imposed on the apartment owner for provision of specific services, for example, removal of both the items, and number two, interest on previously unpaid service charges have been paid. So maybe Connell to you on that on that one, if that's okay. Sure. Um, again, the devil will be in the detail. And so, if, for example, the fee, if part one of that question, which relates to fees, charges, re removal of bulk the items, if that forms part of the service charges budget, which in turn has been approved at general meeting and then uh, billed out in accordance with the apportionment of the scheme then that to me seems to be a charge falling within the meaning of a service charge and therefore should be included. In terms of the second part of the question in relation to interest, my earlier comment applies and I would have some reservations about the recoverability of interest at a rate typically set in leases which is excessive and therefore penal and in my view is not properly part of the service charge. Thank you for that. So Patricia, maybe this one for you. Regarding sinking funds and the amount that is appropriate, what are the guidelines, rules of thumb for an apartment development in a normal situation? Um, well, pursuant to the Act, um, um, I think that the Act suggests that €200 Euros is the recommended um, sinking charge fee per annum. But obviously that's just a general figure given. Um, it's dependent on the type of um, 
of promote um, development. I'd actually refer um, the participants to the owners management company's sustainable apartment living for Ireland as prepared by the housing agency and Clued because I found that to be highly informative with regards thank to... You the, um, thank you for the... the plug. <laughs> Uh, how, but highly informative with regards to um, the rates of um, sinking funds that should be um, that should be applied. Okay, I'm going to go through now the ones the questions that have come in live here. So this is kind of almost almost like a just a minute quiz uh, with a nod to the late Larry Gogan. Um, uh, so uh, maybe I'll throw this one over to you, Suzanne. Um, can the statute of limitations apply to management fee debt? It, it does. Um, I mean, if, if the lease is under seal, it can be 12 rather than six years. But on a, on a practical basis, on a sale, um, it, a new owner is not going to want to take over service charge debt. So irrespective of the statute of limitations, um, and service charges will often be paid on a sale because the statute of limitations is a defense to a court action. It, it doesn't write off the debt. Um, so the some management companies, it depends. I, I wouldn't recommend letting the, the time limit pass before you uh, seek to recover the debt legally. Um, but there, uh, as I say, on a sale, the statute of limitations is somewhat irrelevant because the, the obligations pass under the lease to the new owner. And another one for Suzanne, referring to Suzanne's final slide, what would be typical circumstances under uh, under which a director could be removed from the role. So that's really a company law question rather than a month's act one. Yeah, the, the list tends to be long. There, there's normally about 12 circumstances, you know, if they commit an offence or if they're, uh, they don't attend meetings. Uh, I'm often asked, can the, can the majority of directors remove another director that they're not perhaps getting on with that well? Uh, and the answer typically is no. The constitutions don't tend to allow for that. It has to be the members that remove a director, uh, not, not the other directors. Um, and uh, sometimes constitutions will provide that uh, the director falls into arrears of service charges that they can be removed. Okay, thank you for that. Look, we have, we have almost 50 questions, so it's not possible to get to all of them. I'll put one over to, to Connell here. The common areas uh, transferred to the o have been transferred to the OMC. However, the development has not been handed over to a local council. Is this the developers or the OMC's responsibility? So this sounds like there's part of the estate that's going to be taking the charge. Right, so there seems to be a split going on whereby uh, the common areas have been transferred, but um, a certain portion of the estate is going to be taken in charge by the local county council. Well, to the extent, okay, I've come across that once or twice, to the extent that the transfer of the estate to the local authority does not include all of the common areas or um, functions, there may be a residue remaining in the OMC for it to discharge, in which case, it would, from a practical perspective, it probably means that upkeep of a green or a common area that may have gone into the uh, control of the local authority is no longer part of the OMC's budget, and so the cost comes down. There may be residual services such as insurance, etc., that the OMC still has to pay for, and therefore members have to contribute in terms of their service charge. Okay, look folks, we have an impossible number of questions to, to, to answer there. What I do urge anyone is um, please send in an email to mud, mud at housingagency.ie and we'll endeavour to point you in the right direction. Clearly a lot of the cases are quite complex and you should um, refer to, to, uh, to experts like uh, Conal uh, or Susanna for those in the local authority sector. Um, uh, we can certainly point you in the right, uh, right direction. Otherwise, um, apologies again, we can't get to all the questions. We have one last uh, poll that I might share with you before we wrap up. Uh, and we'd just like to ask you um, what you'd like to see covered in future webinars. So how better to collect management service charges? Um, would you like to know more about sinking funds or building investment funds? More about block insurance, company law, how to hire a management agent or something else? So uh, please give us your, uh, give us your, um, your opinions uh, and your feedback. Um, on that. A reminder again that uh, our email address is mud at housingagency.ie. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch back so we'll put it up um, on our uh, website so that you can all um, 
have a look at it uh, if you want to uh, get into some of the detail um, and we'll share the slides as well. I think our presenters are happy to uh, to share their slides um, in, in future with, uh, with anyone who'd like a copy of them. Um, just to give you quick results of that polling, uh, about 70% uh, of you have have voted, which I think is around a, uh, a pretty good turnout in a, in a, in a national election. Um, so 35% of you think that um, we should cover uh, how to collect service charges. 27% uh, of you want to hear about sinking funds and 17% uh, of you want to hear about company law. So as you'll be aware, our future webinars, uh, one on the 16th of June, which will be um, available to register for on our website, will look at uh, building life cycle reports and building investment funds and our session on the 30th of June, we'll look at the company law side of things uh, with the ICSA. So look, uh, again, renewed apologies, we couldn't get to all your questions. Uh, it just shows the uh, appetite, I suppose, for information in what is uh, a growing um, sector um, nationally. Um, we'll wrap it up there. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the Law Society, to uh, Catherine O'Flaherty for her assistance and collaboration in the background. Thank you very much to uh, our uh, fantastic panelists, to Suzanne Bainton, uh, to Conal Tuhi and to Patricia Murphy. Thank you for your contributions as well on our, uh, on our questions. Uh, a quick word of thanks to my colleagues, Mary Coffey and Katrina Lawler and Michael McHale uh, in the background who uh, made this um, session um, possible. Please keep in touch with us, as I say, through modifhousingagency.ie and you can um, join us for our next webinars on the 16th and 30th of June. So with that, I'll wrap it up. I'll say thanks again to everyone for your contributions and for participating and staying with us for the hour. Uh, Slán, August, stay safe.